Good morning and thanks for coming out. And welcome to today's back to class lecture. For those who are visiting from out of town or in town for the, the football game later today, we're glad you're back. I'm sorry the sun's not shining, but we'll see if we can do something about that. Um, my name's Dan Parrish. I'm the director of the Dartmouth for Life program. I work in alumni relations at Dartmouth. Um, our program sponsors educational events and lectures and travel and professional development all around the world here in Hanover, across the country. Um, if you are visiting from out of town, <coughs> we, uh, we, we are probably coming to your town uh, sometime in the next 12 months. So if you're a Dartmouth alum, uh, keep an eye on communication that comes from us. We send faculty out to do great, great work um, around the country and it's a lot of fun. Um, if you signed in at the table this morning on your way in, uh, you've been registered to win a copy of Charlie's book, The Centrist Manifesto, that he has signed. Uh, if you're not lucky enough to win, we are selling them in the back, and Charlie will hang around afterwards and sign uh, copies of it as well. So that's my pitch for Charlie's, uh, Charlie's latest book, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce Charlie Whelan. Um, after serving as a senior lecturer in, pub in public policy at the Harris School at the University of Chicago, Charles, uh, Professor Whelan joined the Dartmouth faculty as a senior lecturer and policy fellow, fellow at the Rockefeller Center in June of 2012. Charlie's a member of the, class, the Dartmouth class of 1988. He holds a PhD from, in public policy from Chicago and a master's in public affairs from Princeton University. Uh, Charlie has served as a correspondent for The Economist. He's written articles for the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. In March of 2009, he ran for Congress to serve as the representative from the Illinois 5th District in the special election to replace Rahm Emanuel. Charlie describes himself as an author of fun books about serious things, and it's a great description of the work. If you've read any of his, any of his works, it, it fits. His first book, Naked Economics, Undressing the Dismal Science, which I think is just the best description, uh, has been cited as one of the 360 books that every college-bound student should read. The follow-up to that first book, Naked Statistics, Stripping the Dread from the Data, Charlie has a way with alliteration in his, uh, in his titles, reached the New York Times bestseller list for, the hard, for hardback nonfiction. His wildly popular 10 and a half things no commencement speaker has ever said was adapted from the speech that Charlie gave at class day for Dartmouth's class of 2011. Charlie's latest book, The Centrist Manifesto, is a call to action for Americans who are fed up with the current political system and who believe we can do better. Today, he'll share some of the ideas from the centrist movement with us. And so please join me in welcoming Charlie to the stage. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for coming. I should first say just what a privilege it is to be back at Dartmouth full time. I'm in the Rockefeller Sen Center, as Dan said. My freshman dorm was Russell Sage, and in particular, my dorm room was 109 Russell Sage, which is the corner room that is right adjacent to the Rockefeller Center. My office in Rocky looks over 109 Russell Sage, so my life path has taken me about 50 feet, <laughs> if, you, if you actually do the math. Now, the other fun thing about being back here is that during freshman orientation, I met the three women who lived in 105 Russell Sage, and we did the UGA icebreaking exercise, and my job was to introduce to the group Leah Yagian, whose uncle is here, Jerry Danielle. Uh, the icebreaking went very well, and in September, we celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. So we are both back in Hanover, which is great fun, and it was a gradual process. I was teaching at the University of Chicago, my good friend here, Bruce Sasserdote in the econ department, we were on a coffee break, not unlike this, for an alumni magazine meeting, and Bruce said, well, why don't you come back and teach here for a quarter? And I said, well, I could only do it the, during the summer. He said, oh, summer's when we need people. So we came back during the summer, and then we came back the next summer, and we came back the next summer, then I had a sabbatical and we spent the whole year, at which point the kids said, why don't we live here? <laughs> and we had no good answer. <laughs> so. We are now living here full time and it's great to be working with the Dartmouth undergrads and to be part of the Rockefeller Center, which is a great addition to the campus, the public policy programming. I'm gonna talk about the Centrist Manifesto, which is a book that was written not quite by accident, but very close. Uh, I'll give you a little of my history in terms of what led to the motivation for this particular political philosophy, but the book itself was written while I was supposed to be writing other things. So my publisher has always been W.W. W. Norton. Dan mentioned some of the books that I've written for Norton. It's a great relationship. While I was on sabbatical here, I 
entered into a contract with W.W. W. Norton to deliver two books. One was Naked Statistics, because the second is going to be called Money, 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 about monetary policy. And while I was writing Naked Statistics, I just kept getting more and more frustrated by the political process. And so I was taking notes and making, uh, jotting down ideas about what we could do and how we needed something in the center. And it just kept getting more and more serious. And then Simpson Bowles came along, and that fell apart, and I was getting angrier and angrier. And finally, my wife Leah said, you just need to write this book. So I wrote the book. And I didn't tell W. W. Norton. So I finished Naked Statistics, and they said, well, how's that book coming on monetary policy? <laughs> And of course, what I had to tell them is, well, I wrote actually something else. And so I did the courageous thing, which is to call my agent and say, you need to tell them that I wrote a different book. <laughs> so it's like, tell mom that I, you know. So uh, she called, and they said, all right, well, this actually sounds kind of interesting and timely. So I did manage to get away with it. But this is something that was just niggling away at me, and for reasons that probably brought you a lot, a lot of you here today, which is the political process is not necessarily doing what we want to do, but more specifically, I teach Public Policy 40 here at the college. It's a summer course for sophomores, and what we do is go through the serious policy challenges, the places where government and markets intersect, so education, tax policy, the fiscal situation, healthcare, those kinds of things. And what is apparent every year after teaching that class and doing a lot of other work around these issues is that we're not necessarily getting, as a country, done what we need to get done. And that's not to say that there are right answers. If you spend enough time in public policy, you know absolutely they're not right answers on the kinds of things that I just mentioned. But it is arguably true that there are better answers around all of those issues or a range of things we should be doing on infrastructure, on K through 12 education, certainly on the deficit, certainly on healthcare spending. And all of those possible solutions would be better than what we're doing now. And it is also arguably true that if you got a group of policy folks together and kind of cut off the ideological tails, in that room you could get a lot of folks to agree on a different course of action. They wouldn't necessarily come into the room agreeing on what we ought to do, but they would probably say, like Simpson Bowles, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, okay, that's not exactly what I wanted, but I do think it's an improvement on what we're doing now. So I don't think they're right answers, but I think there are a lot of things that we're not doing we should be doing. I think there are a lot of things that are leading in a direction that's not good for the country. So from a policy standpoint, and that is where I've spent most of my career, I'm not pleased, I'm actually quite concerned about the trajectory of the country. That's the substantive side. On the political side, what Dan didn't mention is my first job out of college, to which I owe everything to the Career Services Office, and I see Skip someplace out here, right? So I found it, there he is right there. I got this job through Dartmouth after having traveled around the world for a year, came back and got a job writing speeches for Governor Jock McKernan, governor of Maine at the time. Some of you may recognize that he is more famous now as Olympia Snow's husband, but at the time, he was a governor, and she was just a member of Congress. So he was the senior member of the delegation. Then that Senate seat opened up. I don't, you know, I wasn't present for the conversation, but I'm sure she told him over dinner that her polling numbers were much better than his, which was true. Uh, and in any event, she went on to the Senate. But the more important point is they were both what I would describe as moderate Republicans, New England Republicans, the, the breed of Republican that is systematically being hunted to extinction. But certainly, I, I was quite comfortable with that arrangement, and I liked what Jock was trying to do in Maine. Uh, but that's not necessarily the direction the Republican Party is going, and so I'm not necessarily comfortable with that drift. In Chicago, Dan did mention I ran for Congress, again, almost quite by accident. This seems to be a motif in my life, but I was teaching happily at the University of Chicago when this congressional seat opened up. Because if you recall, President Obama appointed Rahm as chief of staff. Nobody thought that was going to happen. Everybody thought that Rahm was going to stay on and become chief of, or, uh, speaker of the House. So there was no anointed successor. You may or may not remember our governor, Rod Blagojevich, had just been indicted. The second governor in a row, yes. Uh, now, the good news you know, about the centrist theme is Illinois is one of these states that it could go either way with regard to political parties because we send governors to jail of both parties. And so George Ryan was a Republican, Rod Blagojevich was a Democrat. So if you're looking for bipartisan good news, it would be there. Uh, but the serious part is that Blagojevich had been indicted, which meant that the whole Chicago political apparatus froze in place. 
literally everybody assumed everybody else was wearing a wire. <laughs> and so they just stopped. So there was no political involvement in that race. And there was no anointed front runner. And it was a short race. It was three months. And I distinctly remember thinking, I can do anything for three months. It's just like a Dartmouth quarter, <laughs> right? You can just like, you can just power through and it goes by really fast, right? So, uh, and then the last piece was quite serious, which is, okay, I've spent at this point my life around public policy, teaching it, writing for it, for the economists, as a critic of it, for a column, as a columnist and so on. And I had the thought that, okay, while I'm not pleased with the direction the political system is going, I do have enormous respect for the political system because that's how policy gets made. So all of us on the outside who are just criticizing folks as we sit on the couch watching news shows really aren't engaging in the system and we shouldn't expect that it gets a whole lot better. So there was a sense that if I'm gonna talk, write, teach about this stuff, I should do it. So I jumped into that race, I lost, Dan, you probably figured that out, but Dan, Dan was gracious enough not to connect the dots on that one. Um, but it was nonetheless a very interesting experience about what it's like to be on that side, trying to sell serious policy issues to people who are distracted, disengaged, and so on. And I will also say as an aside, and this is probably a sub-theme of the whole talk, the most disappointing part of that race which was the end of 2008, the beginning of 2009. So the financial crisis was well underway. That was a stretch when you woke up every morning, turned on the radio, the Nikkei was down 6%, and S&P futures were start opening down 6%, and you're thinking, boy, this cannot keep going on. It was a very scary time. As I said, we just sent our governor, while well, he was on his way to, to prison, uh, and you couldn't look around the country and say, boy, I think everything is hunky-dory. The, in that race, there were about 23 candidates of all three parties, including the Green Party, which was its own special set of candidates. But um, the Sun-Times pointed out that you know, it actually was a pretty good field. Our turnout was 20%. So in that serious time, with a wide range of candidates, 20% uh, of registered voters mustered the energy to actually get to the polls, which is, as I said, a really disappointing piece. Now, the reason I describe myself as a man without a party is in that process, I ran as a Democrat, I ran as one of the more fiscally conservative Democrats in the field, I had moments where I would stand up in a room not unlike this, and it would be, say, the teachers union. And you, they'd parade all the candidates through, and they'd say, oh, you know, Mr. Whelan, can you tell us how you feel about performance-based pay? You know, I was trained at the University of Chicago. I'm now married to a school teacher. My answer is, I think it's an important tool. And then there's just kind of an awkward silence. <laughs> it's like, well, we got 20 more minutes. Um, should I go on or should we just have donuts? Because it's very clear you're not endorsing me, right? So uh, the rest of this is going to be kind of a charade. So it was clear that I couldn't get out of a Democratic primary. I wasn't comfortable in the Republican Party. And there were a lot of people I know who felt that they were in the same position. So that was kind of eating away, in addition to what I mentioned already about just the political state of things. Um, this again kind of circles back to my public policy 40 days, and it's not that I, you know, everyone's welcome to their own ideological views, it's just that increasingly the ideological views were totally inconsistent with one another. So for example, it's very hard to argue that you, as a Republican, that you're a small government conservative, small c, which is certainly a defensible point of view, and that you're also working hard to pass a constitutional amendment to prevent two people you've never met of the same sex from getting married to each other. Right? That is not small government. I mean, you're welcome to your view on gay marriage, but reconciling these two views in the Republican Party is increasingly difficult. And on the Democratic side, you know, the Democrats purport to stand for poor and minority children, which I think is an important part of the heart of the Democratic Party, but you cannot have the relationship that you have with the teachers unions and do the things that you do to urban education. And my wife taught on the south side and the west side of Chicago and claim that you are doing what's best for poor and minority children. So increasingly, I saw these just complete disconnects. And a lot of, some of the book, some of the chapters, are about these internal inconsistencies and the intellectual drift within the parties. And it's not just about disagreeing, it's just about the fact that they don't, they've come untethered from what might have made sense. Uh, and then of course, the book was written before the shutdown. And by the way, the agreement that came, that came to pass to end the shutdown just postpones the problem, nothing was solved. And we've been working on this since 2010 with Simpson Bowles. So the bad news, I guess, is the shutdown was good for business on the centrist front, but I'd kind of 
wish that it were going the other direction. So what do you do about this? And this is why the book was kind of eating away at me, and that's the genesis of the Centrist Manifesto, which is to think systematically about intellectually what a party that harnessed the middle would look like, and then more important, strategically, and that's what, one of the things I'm going to talk about at the end, the, the strategy of actually empowering the middle. And the book essentially was designed to lay that out. All right, so of the serious issues, I want to talk about one in particular, which is fiscal policy, because I think it's the one that's least ideological in the sense that it's just math. The solutions are ideological. There are obviously a range of things we could do on the taxing and spending side to get this in order, but the problem is not. The problem is just math. And you can look at any projections. I think this is based on CBO data, which most folks feel is probably the best, most nonpartisan source. You can look at assorted projections, but the key here is every time you revise the projections, they get worse. And that only goes up to 2020. You, you can make it as bad as you want if you go to 2035, 2040, 2045. But the key is that when you look at spending and you kind of back it out, you see that most of what's unsustainable in the long run is entitlement spending because we've made promises to ourselves that just the math doesn't work in the long run. And you back out entitlement spending, most of that is healthcare spending because it's growing so much faster than inflation. And it's debatable. I'm not sure I have an answer to whether the Affordable Care Act makes it better or worse. But in any event, with or without affordable care, United States healthcare is fabulously expensive, arguably not delivering terrific outcomes, and in the long run is driving the budget in a direction that it just can't continue to go. We got to do something. All right, so what have we tried to do? Well, Simpson Bowles, to my mind, was a terrific starting point, both substantively and procedurally. So if you recall, I can't remember when it was convened, but they reported back in 2010. Erskine Bowles, who leans, is a Democrat, and Alan Simpson, former Republican senator, were the co-chairs. It was like dodgeball in elementary school. They each had their team. They came up with what, to my mind, was a very attractive package of very unattractive things. Right? What made the package attractive was they actually did the stuff that people had been talking about that nobody particularly likes. It was raising the Social Security retirement age modestly. It was a higher gas tax. It was changing. The, the way the cost of living is adjusted so that Social Security benefits wouldn't go up as quickly. Uh, they did do tax reform, which is probably one of the things that's not that attractive, except for the folks who lose their, lose their loopholes. Not that unattractive. It's actually probably the closest thing to a free lunch that we've got. Lots of spending cuts, some new revenue, and so on. So if you look at the list, you'd probably dislike everything on there. But in total, it was a very sensible package. And I remember going to the American Economics Association in January of 2011, where they had a panel of economists that really did represent the broad spectrum of thinking from people who'd worked for Gore, somebody who'd worked for George W. Bush, some folks from the European Central Bank. The last question to the panel was, Simpson Bowles, yes or no? Right? You don't get to do what academics like to do, which is to quibble with every thing, you know, how much better you could have made it with your giant brain. No, and so just yes or no to the package that had been negotiated. They went down the table. It was yes, 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 yes. So this was, at a minimum, a good starting point for discussions, and it wouldn't have been a bad package to pass straight up or down. And you remember, if a supermajority of this commission had voted to endorse its findings, then it would have gone to Congress for a mandatory up or down vote, which I would argue procedurally would have been quite powerful, because then it would have given Congress the ability to say, boy, you know, I hate everything in here, but you know, it, we're doing something. It would at least force that uncomfortable realization. All right, so well, what happened? They didn't get the supermajority. And you can see the colors represent the different parties. It was kind of bipartisan in the folks who voted it down, obviously for different reasons. The Republicans said they couldn't countenance the revenue increases. The Democrats said they couldn't countenance the spending cuts, particularly on entitlement. So they each brought their own, I would argue, motivated by the tail views, but in the end, it didn't happen. And I would go further to say, if you think about who the intellectual leaders were at the time, they did not get behind it. So clearly, Obama let the report lie there. There was no getting out in front and saying that we should absolutely do this. I, think, I can't remember what the exact phrasing was at the time. Nancy Pelosi said uh, that she did not support it because of the entitlement cuts. But then if you look at the other side, the guy, Paul Ryan, who was clearly, at the time, the go-to person on fiscal issues for the Republicans also voted no. And I would argue if he'd voted, no, voted yes, 
he could have brought some other folks on. They would have gotten the supermajority. I think it's also true if the president had gotten behind it. They could have perhaps gotten the supermajority. In any event, it didn't happen. And that was 2010. The shutdown is essentially a continuation of this. And to back up where I came from, the fiscal issue is one that we cannot afford to continue. That's just the math. So this is, to me, the fiscal situation is this marriage of a political inability to get stuff done to the fact that substantively we got a serious issue that has got to be wrestled with. All right, so how does, you know, how's the political system working in general? And this is kind of a clever little graph that, I didn't do it, but that plots how the propensity of Congress to work with one another across the aisle, and what you see in kind of the earlier years is you see a lot more collaboration across parties. As that winnows over time, you see them kind of for working further and further apart. So it's not your imagination that there is this partisan drift in Congress, which of course contributes to our inability to get stuff done. Now, how does the public feel about this? All right, somebody just wrote a statistics book. I'm not going to put a lot of weight behind this statistical poll, but nonetheless, when the public was asked to do head-to-head -head comparisons, uh, you know, you have to, which of these two is more favorable? Congress loses to head lice, they lose to the colonoscopy, they lose to root canal, they lose to nickelback, and they lose to, substantially to use car salesmen. Um, I did look at the data before I put this up. Uh, the, the only entity that Congress beats is Donald Trump, head to head. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll leave that for another day. Um, on a more serious note, this is quite methodologically sound. What you see, and probably what you sense in talking to your friends and everything else, is a secular decline in support or membership in the two traditional parties a rise in people who self-describe themselves as independent, moderate, non-aligned. There's a lot we could drill down on what that language actually means. One person's independent is not always the same as another person's independent. They could be left or right of the traditional parties. But nonetheless, I urge you to look at the trajectory, which is clearly down for the two traditional parties, up for people who are outside of that traditional party. And then, more interestingly, this came out just two weeks ago. This is, as you can see, the highest level ever. You have 60% of Americans saying that the two traditional parties don't do a good enough job at dealing with their issues, and they would support a major third party. 60%, which means that's a lot more people, by the way, than who identify themselves as independents. So this is also Republicans and Democrats who are either saying, I would be more comfortable in a third party, or I think a third party would be comfortable, would, would help my party perhaps by forcing it back to the center. So you could argue that a third party in the middle might be good for the Republicans by changing the trajectory of what's going on. But in any event, that number to me is quite powerful. All right. Meanwhile, about the same time, Esquire NBC News comes out with a poll drilling down on issues, and they come up with a number around 51% of people who broadly could be described as centrist. And what in their poll that means is they're willing to compromise on issues where the two traditional parties would not. So they don't despise government, but they're also somewhat skeptical of what government can accomplish. They would support a budget deal that involves revenue increases and spending cuts, those kinds of things. It's a very interesting finding that you should take a look at. So, but the point is there, there are a lot of different information sources suggesting both that people are disaffected with the two traditional parties, also that they are not, the country is not as polarized as the members of Congress. That's the other key theme here. If we were as polarized as Congress, then we'd have a real problem, because then it's just the country can't reconcile itself. Then it's kind of 1854 kinds of problems. But the, the good news or the bad news, depending on how you look at it here, is that there is still a broad American middle in the electorate. The bad news is Congress doesn't reflect that. So the whole point of the centrist movement is to try and re-empower that middle to assert itself in the political process to deal with some of the substantive problems that I was talking about. All right, so I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, mostly because there's a lot of money there, uh, but also because if you haven't spent much time out there, there's just this great can-do attitude. You know, you say, look, we need to raise $250,000 for this, and they'll say, are you crazy? You need 25 million. <laughs> but, all right, we'll do that, right? I mean, they're just, everything has to be bigger. Uh, but, you know, the, my original pitch to Silicon Valley was, okay, I'm going to describe an industry where there are two incumbent firms, each of which is over 100 years old. 85% of their combined customers are displeased, and that you know, is probably outdated. I think we probably are about 91% right now. 
Uh, the younger of these two firms was founded explicitly to deal with the issue of slavery, right? So that's kind of intellectually where all this is coming from. You think there's room for a new entrant? And at this point, the Silicon Valley folks are like, yeah, let me add that firm. Is it the cable company? No, it couldn't be the cable company. What is it? I'm like, that's the political system, right? And this is how we ought to think about it. What I'm trying to pitch here is just political innovation. So what would, the part, what would a centrist party and or a centrist movement stand for? And in Q&A, we can talk about whether this needs to be a party, whether this should be some kind of collaboration among folks who are more comfortable in the center. But in any event, what the book outlines, and this is probably the one thing that the book does more in depth than I'll have time to do here, is to take the best of each party. The, the key point is that being a centrist doesn't have to be just a hodgepodge of compromises. Well, we'll do half of that, half of this. There are actually great ideas that are embedded in each party that you could keep while cutting loose the tails and what people perceive as the baggage to create something that's quite powerful, right? So on the Democratic side, we know, and I can tell you as a policy professor, good government is what makes markets work. It is a prerequisite for wealth creation. I teach classes where I take people to the developing world, and those places need infrastructure. They need rule of law. They need binding contracts. They need courts that work. They would they would literally thrive and prosper if we could export the kinds of institutions that we have. Respect for the environment is one where I would argue it should be paired with fiscal responsibility because it is about not living better today at the expense of the future. Social tolerance, most of which if you look historically has come from the democratic side. They've been out in front of that. And just a, a general commitment to social justice, I would argue is kind of having your heart in the right place even if they don't always operationalize it. On the Republican side, the respect for wealth creation, which is, okay, if you want, to help, you want to solve poverty, you need more of the pie to pass around. That means trade, that means markets, that means having a skeptical eye towards the cost of taxation and regulation, those kinds of things. It doesn't mean they're inherently bad, but it does mean you should be aware of the economic costs that they may impose. Belief in individual responsibility, the importance of families as the building block for society. If you don't have functional families, I can tell you it's nearly impossible to do everything else. Commitment to small government, which I kind of talked about, the general skepticism of what government can accomplish. Federalism is a very healthy idea, which is in places where we disagree or where there are different preferences across the country. There is, in many cases, no harm to pushing things down to the state. So the states, as long as there's not a huge spillover across states, can choose their own path. And obviously, defense is a core government responsibility. If you take economics, you know that defense is a public good. It's one of the most important things that we can do collaboratively, and government's what enables us to do that. So if we took the best of both parties, what would the bumper sticker look like? Well, fiscal responsibility I've talked about. Environmental responsibility, I actually like pairing those two, in part because when you put them together, I would argue you've eliminated both parties. I don't think the Democrats are fiscally responsible right now. I don't think the Republicans are either, but I think there are a lot of people in the Republican Party who care a lot about that, and on the Democratic side too. Uh, environmental responsibility, for reasons I just discussed. Social tolerance, which is, if you play bridge, a giant finesse here, but mostly it is a marriage of the libertarian streak of the Republicans with what would be described as the liberalism of the Democrats, but in large part saying, if it doesn't affect people outside of your household, let it alone. And that is just both a way to move forward, it also happens to be a way that a lot of people think about issues ranging from gay marriage all the way to guns. Uh, and you know, something like guns, I, I think I would argue we should observe the Heller decision which says if you wanna have a gun in your house, you can have a gun in your house. When you take it outside, then we need to talk, right? I mean, that's like, and that's kinda of where a lot of these issues uh, would, at least we could probably negotiate a ceasefire. And then a genuine commitment to economic opportunity. And I, I'm not sure that either party, both parties talk a good game, but I think this really means in the age of profound income inequality, which I think has the capacity to eat away at the fabric of our society, a genuine commitment to looking across society and saying, all right, does every child really have access to a decent education? To the people who are displaced by trade or by, uh, by movement to uh, capital goods where you're being replaced by machines, uh, are the, the effects of globalization, are we providing second chances, worker training, the kinds of things that give people from birth to their middle age a real chance to participate in this growing economy? If not, 
then I think we've got some serious repercussions. So that's you know, the bumper sticker, and we can talk more about the specifics, but I think that's an attractive group of principles around which you could get people in the middle to agree, and those folks are likely to be pragmatic enough that you could perhaps get them to agree on things that the tails would disagree over. All right, the strategy is where this always gets tripped up. People, you, you make the pitch to this point, they're like, well, wasn't this just Ralph Nader and Ross Perot? The first and most important point is you cannot run somebody for the presidency. The Electoral College makes that a complete non-starter. So you have to get past the presidency. It's a fool's errand, and it's where I think a lot of movements get tripped up, whether over the vanity or what have you. Unfortunately, I think you've also got to forget the House for now because there are so many hyper-partisan districts and the gerrymandering has made it bad enough that most of those uh, seats are quite safe. And I think you'd have to elect a lot of centrist House members before you had some real traction. This, I think, by the way, is the major limitation of the strategy because as we saw a couple weeks ago, the House is you know, the party, the more out of control branch of government at the moment. But the place where you can make the most difference, arguably as early as 2016, is in the US Senate. And here's how it would work. If you were to pick a handful of states, and by the way, I'll show you this in a, in a minute, there are 22 states right now that have a senator from one party and a senator from the other, or a senator from one party and a governor from the other party. So there are, at a minimum, 22 states that can go either way, and most likely it's people in the middle who are swinging those elections one way or the other. So you have 22 states, New England offering a fair number of them, where it would be credible to say that a candidate in the middle would have a fighting chance to win. Now let's assume that you pick a state in 2016 that has an open primary, meaning that you have no incumbents running, so it's an open seat, actually. We know how those elections shape up. The Republicans and Democrats hold their primaries, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but the primaries, of course, are a contributor to what goes on because the primary voters are the most hyper-partisan in each party. So to get out of your primary, and this goes back to what I was talking about in Chicago, you got to say things for your base that you may or may not believe, but certainly are not the most attractive things to voters in the middle. So you're on the right, and yes, clearly every kindergartner needs to take a gun to school, and you know, on the left, the retirement age is currently too high, we need to bring it down to 48, and oh, we can pay for it. And, you know, then what traditionally happens is you rush to the middle, and you do what Mitt Romney contributed forever, which is the Etch-a-Sketch, right? Well, you know, not every kindergartner needs a gun, and you know, uh, 48 might be a little low. You know, you try and walk the stuff back because you know that was just what you had to say, and you need to win the center. Imagine that race, but with a centrist candidate from day one, so that there is a person in the race who is looking only to the general election. And as the two parties do what they have to do, which is compete in their primaries, this person is speaking to the moderate middle from the beginning, and you should recall, you do not need 50% to win a Senate race. It's 34%, you need a plurality. So I ask you, are there a handful of states where a centrist candidate could win 34% of the vote? That answer is almost certainly yes. Let's roll it up one step further. Now we we'll go back. And imagine you have a Senate that is 47, 5, 48, right? At which point, you're Anthony Kennedy, right? And I think it's not just about having the votes. We'll talk about some of the other things. But at that point, you have certainly disproportionate power and more importantly, the capacity to be the bridge to between the two parties. So that is the strategy around which the moderate middle would reassert itself in the process, right? States where it could happen, there are already five states where independent voters outnumber Republicans and Democrats in absolute numbers combined. Uh, again, look at how many of those are in um, you got Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, either the uh, Atlantic states or New England. That's the map of the states. The purple one, the purple doesn't show up very well, but the states that have mixed statewide office holders where you would start. And think about what happens if you get this mix in the Senate. I already talked about the swing votes, but it's not just about flexing your political muscle. If you have only five senators, it also changes the mentality of the way that you function in the Senate. Namely, you're never going to win a majority in the Senate. Therefore, everybody on both sides is a potential ally. 
You can look to the Democrats and say, look, if you're serious about putting a price on carbon, here are five votes. You can look to the Republicans and say, if you're serious about entitlement reform or fixing the tax code, we have five votes here. Because you can't do anything alone. It changes the dynamic, which is currently about one party thinking, boy, if we just stick it to the other guys, eventually we'll have enough votes we can get everything we want. That mentality changes. The other thing that I think would be very important is thinking about the centrist as the intellectual center of the Senate and of the federal government, which is to say, on major issues, whether it's immigration, tax reform, what have you, people can say, all right, well, what are the centrists saying? Right? What idea has been floated? Kind of like a perpetual Simpson-Bowles commission. And the idea also is that you've elected people whose mission is to get stuff done. And so when they vote on a Simpson-Bowles type process that includes some things you don't like, they've done exactly what you told them to do, which is to get something done on the budget, as opposed to coming back to either party and saying, oh, by the way, I sorry, I had to raise taxes or I had to cut entitlements, at which point they violated one of the core tenets of your party. Instead, you sent them there to be pragmatic problem solvers, and that's what they did. All right, is this crazy? Well, it happened in Israel. So for those of you who follow Israeli politics, the Yes Atid party came, was one year old. It literally translates to something about the center. In the last parliamentary elections, they won, the parliamentary system is admittedly different, but they won 19 out of 120 seats. They were one year old. And of course, that was the headline, which is, okay, now you get 19 seats, you determine who's the prime minister. Again, it's different in a, prime, in a uh, parliamentary system, but you then have injected yourself in the government. Now, I would argue I don't think they've done anything significant with the power that they earned, but I think it proves electorally that when people are fed up with a hyperpartisan system and somebody credible comes along and says, here, we want to represent the center, that it actually can happen. <coughs> Let me conclude with two things. <laughs> One, this is meant to be somewhat glib, but not entirely, which is, okay, if not this, what then? Right? And if you got a better idea, I would like to play more golf. Right? <laughs> because, again, going back to where I began, I am deeply concerned about the direction that the country's taking on the policy front. And I think that we have an obligation to do something about it. My fear is that sensible Americans have started to treat the political process a little like the Chicago Cubs. I was a long time Chicago, which is they're terrible, they continually disappoint me, and I'm just going to quit watching them, right? Which is fine for the Cubs and actually harder to do than you would think, but <laughs> it doesn't work for politics, right? If, if sensible people don't engage in the process, you create a vacuum, and that's how we got Rod Blagojevich in Illinois. So we don't have the opportunity or the luxury of just stepping aside and saying we're fed up. So my serious question is, this is the best I got, you got something better, let's do that. And then I'll finish with uh, something more upbeat, which is I actually believe that the political system today looks a lot like the big three automakers in about 1970, when they had 86% of the market share. And at that time, nobody could envision anything other than competition among the big three. That's what you had to choose from. And that's the way they looked at the world. And if you remember, I, you know, I was young in 1970, but I certainly remember about 1975 when the most exciting part of every family vacation was when the car broke down, right? Because it was always in some out of the way place and we got to stay there for a while, right? <laughs> People knew that the cars were lousy, but this was the choice they had, right? Nobody saw Toyota coming along. And I do believe that given the current state of the product and this belief that this is all we've got to cho choose from, that if something were to disrupt this, we could see a fairly rapid shift in the way people align themselves. So with that, I will entertain questions, of which I hope there will be many, better ideas, worse ideas, complaints, what have you, but thank you very much for sharing part of your day. Right there. How will you get around the rules of the Senate that permit filibusters and, and uh, one yeah. senator hold? So it's a great, I mean, the, f the first good news is that two things that I don't think are healthy at all, one is campaign finance and one is kind of the obstructionist rules in the Senate, would both work to our advantage. Right? I think, just as an aside, I think the campaign finance system is a complete disaster. I can tell you as a candidate, it's worse than you think. Um, not merely because of its corrupting influence, but also because it just takes so much time 
in terms of raising money and also because it drives out sensible candidates. But what it means for us is you can take a lot of money from all over the country and channel it to specific Senate races. But back to your question about the rules of the Senate, it also means that four or five senators can shut down the place for business. It means that unlike the House, they actually have to pay attention to you. Now people often ask me, they think it's a really tough question, well who are they going to caucus with? And my answer is, well who's got the best deal, right? I mean, <laughs> your vote, you know, what, you know, what are you serving? Did you got the jelly donuts? Eh, you know, they got eggs over there, right? I mean, you forget <laughs> that you are the Anthony Kennedy. Nobody cares what Anton Scalia or Elena Kagan thinks about gay marriage because you know how they're going to vote. And so when you're Anthony Kennedy and you have rules that favor you, I think it's quite important. People also ask, well, you know, how would they get along with Mitch McConnell or Harry Reid? And my answer is Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid aren't going to be majority leader, right? Who picks the majority leader when it's 47, 5, 48? The centrist. And neither party is going to put up somebody so polarizing. What they're going to, it's like baseball arbitration. What they're going to do is put up the person most attractive to the center who is still acceptable to their own members. It's going to force that leadership to the middle. So I actually think the rules of the Senate, and that's why we're going for the Senate, are quite favorable to what we're trying to do. All right. My question is related to American history, uh, the famous election of 1912. There were two parties, Republican and Democrat. The Republicans split with bad results for them. Do you see any relevance? Yeah, only in that the presidency is the problem. I, I, that's one of the reasons we don't want to go after the presidency is because, I mean, I don't remember 1912, but I, I would say this is roughly the same thing might have happened in Florida in 2000, which is when you start messing with the presidency and the electoral college, third party candidate isn't going to win and it could end up skewing the preferences of everybody else. So uh, that's a good example, but that's one of the many reasons why we're totally steering out of the presidency. The system is just not designed uh, for that. Yes? I'd just like to know, uh, in terms of finding candidates in the center, won't you always have a problem with either party seeing it as such a threat that they're going to, uh, one of them is going to feel they're going to suffer more than the other, and it, won't it be necessary to find a centrist candidate for one of the two existing parties of high caliber uh, reputation? Yeah, so there are actually a lot of really good things embedded in the, in the question. The first is the two parties, no matter what happens, where it is, or what candidate, are going to feel very threatened. Like if you remember my automaker example, what brought them together was Japanese competition. Right, suddenly they could all agree that tariffs on Japanese automobiles were a great idea because they all shared the threat. So I do think that if there were a credible candidate in 2016 in a state, the two parties would, you'd see a, a degree of collaboration we haven't seen in 20 years. <laughs> Unfortunately, it would be a bad place for them to be collaborating. So in, with regard to candidates, we see, we don't have specific candidates identified, we see three prototypes, like profiles of people who would be attractive candidates. One you mentioned, which is, if you had a current Republican or Democrat of high standing with a reputation for bipartisan work who defected, who said, you know what, I'm fed up with my party, I want to be the first centrist, that would be probably the best. Olympia Snow comes to mind. If Olympia Snow had not quit the Senate, out of frustration, by the way, and instead said, you know what, I'm still going to, I'm still me, my politics haven't changed, the rest of the world is moving in different directions, I'm going to be the first centrist with an eye to history actually, so if somebody with a lot of vanity, this would be terrific. Um, that would be number one, and I don't think that's incredible. Number two would be somebody outside the political process but with a reputation for having some sense of common weal. You know, if, if, if Warren Buffett were a younger man, if Bill Gates had not spent most of his time on the philanthropy and had political interests, some of the Silicon Valley people who have big reputations, lots of money, some have better reputations than others, but somebody came out of that world and said, you know what, the political system needs to be fixed and I'm going to be part of it. That person, I think, would be a credible candidate in a lot of places. And number three would be if somebody like Bloomberg came along, and Bloomberg's not going to run for the Senate, uh, and said, you know, I just found $100 million on my dresser, and, and I'm, you know, who knew it was there, right? Um, but, and I'm going to use it to create a fund for centrist candidates. I'm going to be the first chair of the centrist party, which, by the way, you know, and I have been down to City Hall 
they're quite coy about what he wants to do after mayor, but the one thing they did say is he's done with mayor soon. He won't run for president because he can't win. He won't run for Senate because it's not president, and he wants to do something relevant nationally. I'm like, huh, <laughs> I've got an opportunity. Uh, but that would be another, so he then would create the umbrella and the credibility under which people could run for the Senate. So I think those three, including the one that you mentioned about somebody defecting, would be the most logical candidates. Oh, the other day, oh, Stanley uh, Druckenmeier had a, a wonderful article in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I don't know whether you saw that, but he, part, uh, he sparked my interest, which is why I'm here today, that saying that he was addressing young people about what was happening fiscally and how they were getting, quote, ripped off by yeah. my generation, yeah. and that they were basically the generation of change. My question to you is, do your students get it? And what, isn't it more likely that that's where it's gonna have to start, a it's, youth movement? Yeah, no, I love this question. Uh, the, there's good news, bad news. The good news is uh, my students and other students with whom I'm in contact totally get it. Doesn't mean they necessarily buy into this, but they are totally disaffected by what they see on the political front and beyond, right? If you think about what the 20 year olds in my classroom have lived through, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the economic collapse, uh, the financial crisis, the failure of government to act on things they care a lot about, the environmental front, the fiscal situation, the United States hasn't been at its best over the 20 years that they've been around. So they totally get it, and they also look to the two political parties as if they were the Whigs and the Federalists. Right? The, neither party, I mean, they just kind of look at the Republicans and they're like, you guys are mean, right? They just. You know, their views on gay marriage are out of sync with, there's still diversity, but they're just not the same as those in the 40 to 60 crowd. In fact, we had Frank Gallup come to class, and he said there has been no history, there's been no issue in the history of polling where public opinion has moved as quickly as it has. And by the time you get to young people, there's, you know, just overwhelming support for gay marriage. And unlike some fiscal issues, he doesn't think it's gonna change as they get older. So they look at the Republicans like, well, you know, whatever, that's kind of interesting. And then they, they look to the Democrats and they're just kind of like old and musty. It's like, you talk a lot about the environment, but you haven't actually done anything about it. And you know, the, you, you talk a lot about economic opportunity, but you haven't delivered it. Uh, and they're a little disappointed in Obama. Uh, so the good news is they're, looking for something new. The bad news is, historically, young people haven't shown up. 2008 for Obama is kind of an exception. When I ran and the experts came in, and I'm like, well, we should go to this camp, college campus. Like, no, you just need to ignore everybody under 30. They don't vote. I'm like, but they're so important. They don't vote. Like, oh, but you know, we ought to go, no, you're going to the nursing home. Like, oh. <laughs> Bingo night again. Uh, so the question is whether you can, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there were a lot of bingo nights. Um, the question is whether you can get that group to show up and do so. The question is whether you can get everybody to do something, but that group in particular, and at present they haven't shown us much. Charlie, um, you mentioned Simpson Bowles. Recently I've been reading and hearing commentators talk about Simpson Bowles point two zero. Uh, they're reworking the, the, um, the uh, proposal. Um, is there any chance that a mainstream Republican or a Democrat, a, a Jeb Bush or a Hillary Clinton, um, might embrace something like that? And if they do, would they have any chance of getting a nomination? I think that you put your finger on the problem, which is I think it would do great things for the chances of getting elected in the general election. Right? I think if either one of those candidates came out and said, you know what? We got to do something. Here's what I propose. You're not going to like it all. And in fact, Gallup, I didn't put it up. Gallup had a poll around the time of the first Simpson Bowles as it kind of rolled into the super committee, which was the next version, that said 60% of Americans, this is in the book, said at the time that they would support a compromise even if it included things they didn't personally agree with. So the public was way out in front of that. But I think the second part of your problem or your question is the problem, namely play out the primary which is I don't think the Republican candidates, I mean, think about what Mitt Romney went through. And we, you know, whether you liked his politics or not, he's a decent person with a powerful record as a governor of a major state. He shouldn't have had to go through that nonsense, right? Nobody should have to run against Michelle Bachman. Excuse me, right? I mean, and 
And so I think he would just get beat up over things like the gas tax increase, which I can tell you as an economist is the first place you ought to go get revenue because you always want to tax externalities, right? You want to tax pollution or do you want to tax capital, labor, and savings? Go with pollution. So I don't think he's going to get out of a Republican primary. And I think on the Democratic side, if you say I'm going to raise the Social Security age, uh, the AARP blows up your car. Um, so uh, I think... It, I think the primary system is a big problem on that front, and I, don't, I think the public would get behind it, but I think it's hard to become a candidate, to get on the ballot, to present that kind of a moderate solution. Charlie, two, two more questions. Two more. One here. One way in the back. Why is there, oh, sorry. Why is there such a discrepancy, huge discrepancy between the political alignments of the voters and the political alignments of the elected officials? Oh, this is great. So we could bring the whole political science department or government department in and they could <laughs> talk for about six hours on this. Um, there are a lot of answers, um, some of which is there is some g genuine partisanship, right? I mean, there's a, like everywhere, there is a continuum of opinion and that's healthy, but it gets exacerbated by a whole bunch of things. One is Increasingly, we're residentially sorting ourselves by ideology. So it's far more likely today than 50 years ago that you're, you're going to live around fellow Republicans, live around fellow Democrats, which is, of course, why my district in Lincoln Park, Chicago, wasn't terribly competitive across parties. Whoever won that Democratic primary was going to win. We then heap on top of that the gerrymandering, which is, okay, now in too many states, we're going to look at the congressional boundaries and we're going to draw them in such a way that a dead Republican can beat a live Democrat and vice versa, depending on who's in control of the state. One thing that we haven't studied that I'm convinced makes a difference, I don't have the data yet, is I think the 24-hour news cycle cable channels sorting themselves by ideology is a profoundly pernicious influence. People can now tune in to whatever view they want to see. These shows, by the way, are not about informing people. They're about drumming up ratings. Robert Reich, who was back class of what, 68, was back, and he tells a great story where he was on a cable news network, and he's talking, and they go to break, and the, the producer says in his earpiece, you're going to have to yell more. Uh, and he's like, I don't really think that's productive. I have nothing to yell about. So no, you're going to have to yell more. Just yell about something. Um, <laughs> and he's like, I, you know, there's, I'd rather have a discussion. I, I don't think I should. you got to yell. And she's like, and he says, I'm going to start yelling soon, but it's not a... Uh, <laughs> But I, so I think that that takes a system that's already prone to polarization and makes it worse. Um, I think the primary system, for reasons I just discussed, makes it worse. I think campaign finance makes it worse because people who are hyper-motivated are the ones who can write enormous checks, which means that people in the middle don't have as much influence. So I think, sadly, you've got a whole host of forces that are creating a partisanship in the outcomes that don't necessarily reflect the partisanship in the underlying voters. And that's not what democracy is supposed to be about. One more, last one. Whoever's got the microphone, I'm afraid. Well, uh, you choose it, Charlie. <laughs> uh, I'll put the pressure on right you. Right there, he's got some. Oh, no, he's just rubbing his nose. Uh, <laughs> go right there, and the, you're close. There you go. Sorry. Is there an organization of like minded people and a blog uh, that is promoting this idea? Well, as luck would have it, we've actually started an organization. Uh, so, yes, if you go to thecentristmovement.org, we are doing that. We, being a lot of Dartmouth folks, uh, there's a full time executive director. Uh, so, there, yeah, there is a movement around creating the party. And it, by the way, don't go to the centrist party because that's somebody else's domain name. He hasn't updated it in about 10 years. So it's the centristmovement.org. But more important, there are also a lot of other groups. No Labels is one, Third Way, that are playing in the sandbox. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to kind of ride two horses. One is to create the party for people who actually want to join an organization that's consistent with what I described. The second is to act as an umbrella group for other organizations that may not be comfortable joining a new party, and that would include moderate Republicans and Democrats, but who want to empower the center. And we just got a big donation from somebody in California to hold a centrist summit, which would bring all these groups together to talk about how, you know what, we're all kind of crying in the wilderness. If we were to act together, we could actually have more influence and to talk about some shared path forward. So there are, the good news is there are a lot of folks working in this space, but as was pointed out earlier, there's also a lot of profound institutional resistance as well. So on that, I'll stick around, sign books, enjoy the game, welcome back, and thank you for coming.